Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar with Dyne Therapeutics to share information about their upcoming clinical trial uh, now that their IND is cleared with the FDA. I'm Eric Camino. I'm the Vice President of Research and Clinical Innovation, and with me is Pat Furlong, PPMD's founder and CEO. Uh, for the webinar today, we're going to be joined by Ash Duger, the SVP, Global Head of Medical Affairs, and Molly White, VP, Global Head of Patient Advocacy and KOL Engagement for Dyne. Um, they'll be sharing updates for the development plan uh, for Dyne 251, their novel exon skipping compound for those amenable to uh, skipping exon 51. Uh, there will be an open Q&A at the end of today's talk. So if you have any questions um, during the talk, uh, please feel free to submit them into the, the text box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can during the Q&A. Um, Ash, if you are ready to go, I'd be happy to let you take it from here. Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, so as Eric mentioned, uh, I'm Ash Dugar, the Head of Medical Affairs at Dine Therapeutics, and joined by Molly White, our Head of Patient Advocacy. Um, first, I'd like to thank Pat, Eric, Ryan, Kaylin, and the entire PPMD for inviting us to update the Duchenne community on the progress of our Duchenne program, and specifically Dine 251, our clinical candidate designed to treat patients with Duchenne who are amenable to Exxon 51 skipping. As always, it is a real privilege to speak with the Duchenne community. These are forward-looking statements. Please refer, refer to our website if interested in more detail. So at Dine, it all starts with our mission. Um, as you've probably heard me say in the past, we are laser-focused on delivering life-transforming therapies to patients with serious muscle diseases, with Duchenne being a priority. And this mission is really core to who we are and what we do every single day. As Eric mentioned, we are so excited to inform you that our Dine 251 program is officially off of FDA clinical hold, and we are fully cleared to begin our first clinical trial. Just as a, a brief reminder, uh, we are on clinical hold because the FDA asked for some additional information. Uh, we were not in the clinic, so there were no issues or events seen in the clinic. So this was just a, a process we had to go through, and now we're really excited that we're off of FDA clinical hold and can start our clinical trial. So our focus today is on sharing our approach to the clinic for Dine 251 and provide an update on our clinical trial plan now that we're off of hold. So over the last several years, we built a robust portfolio focused on rare muscle diseases. DM1 and FSHD, shown in this slide, represent opportunities to develop first-in-class therapeutics. And in Duchenne, as shown in the middle part of the slide, we're building a portfolio of potential therapies starting with our Exxon 51 program, known as Dine 251, and we'll follow this with additional Exxon skipping programs for Exxon 53, 45, and 44. So this slide summarizes the tremendous amount of work we've done in animals and patient cells to characterize forth and how it may provide advantages over existing therapeutic approaches. We've extensively characterized targeted delivery to muscle, exon skipping, and dystrophin expression, as well as safety and tolerability in various research models. I won't go through each of these points in detail, but just at a high level, in our DMD, in our DMD program, we've generated comprehensive uh, animal data supporting our entry into the clinic, including robust and durable exon skipping and dystrophin expression in skeletal muscle, including diaphragm, important for uh, respiratory function, and cardiac mm -hmm. muscle, as well as reduced muscle damage and increased muscle function in the MDX mouth model, which is a standard model in Duchenne research. Dine 251, our clinical candidate, was also shown to be well tolerated and safe and have a favorable safety profile, as well as demonstrating impressive exon skipping in non-human primates or, or monkeys. Uh, and we were really excited about the results that we've shown in the past, especially in the heart and the diaphragm, uh, muscles that weaken over time, leading to the morbidity and mortality in people living with DMD. We anticipate dosing patients in the middle of this year for our Dine 251 program, and we continue to expand our portfolio to address mutations amenable 
to skipping additional exons, such as 53, 45, and 44. So all of the data that we've generated has formed the foundation of our entry into the clinic. And as we prepare to start our DIN 251 clinical development program, we have gained expert feedback. We've engaged key opinion leaders, or KOL, from various disciplines, including pediatric and adult neurology, cardiology, physical medicine and rehabilitation, pulmonology, and physical therapy. And importantly, we've gathered this feedback across the globe. KOLs both in the U.S. and outside of the U.S., including Europe, with experience running early and late-stage trials, have provided advice on our overall clinical development program, including our clinical trial design, the patient population, biomarker and functional endpoints, and key safety considerations. Very importantly, They've also emphasized the importance of natural history and helped us to extract key learnings from the, uh, the, the vast amount of natural history work that's been done in the field. It's clear that KOLs believe the trophin continues to be a key endpoint for this condition. And we've also received advice directly from patients and caregivers, as well as global advocacy leaders, such as those from PPMD and the Duchenne Community Advisory Board comprising of advocacy leaders from several countries and chaired by Pat Berlin. They provided insights based on their living with and being the voice of the Duchenne community, as well as experience with past and current trials. And this input has been extremely important in ensuring a patient-centric design and has included, but is not limited to, key considerations for choosing a clinical trial, review of and input to our informed consent form, feedback on biopsies and functional outcomes, and identification of the most burdensome or difficult parts of the trial, and how to ensure patients and families are supported throughout this process. And based on this extensive feedback, we've developed a proposed clinical study for DIN 251 in patients amenable to exon 51 skipping. And I'll describe some of the key elements now. So our clinical trial for DIN 251 will be a global multiple ascending dose or MAD placebo controlled study with a long term extension. It's important to note that following the placebo controlled portion of the study, all patients will be eligible to receive active treatment. We plan to enroll patients with Duchenne who have mutations amenable to exon 51 skipping, as I've mentioned. And our goal is to enroll approximately 30 to 50 male participants ages 4 to 16 year, uh, years old who are either ambulant or non-ambulant. We have heard from the community that uh, there needs to be more, uh, more out there, especially for the non-ambulant patients. We plan to evaluate the following outcomes in this MAD study. These include safety and tolerability, dystrophin by Western blot, muscle function relevant to both ambulatory and non-ambulatory participants. So that would include assessments to help us understand changes in lower and upper limb function, as well as lung function. And we do plan to be dosing monthly or even less frequently as we get into the clinic. With the help of our expert advisors, we're very confident that our study design is robust, that it will measure key outcomes, and that we're striving to manage the burden on families. We plan to outline additional details, including more specifics around the trial design and endpoints, as well as timing of data um, soon or around the time when our first patient was dosed for the program. So more details will follow. So on behalf of Dyne, I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention uh, in listening to this presentation. And at this point, I'm pleased to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh Thanks really so much, Ash. This was a very nice overview. If you don't mind, I'd like to go back through the slides and ask you some very targeted questions. I do recognize that some questions you may be unable to answer, so you can you can say that to me. But I but I am going to ask you some questions if that's all right with you. Of course, please do. Okay. On slide number four, should we start there? Yes. 
Okay. In your pipe. Um, I think this community is well aware that the potential of antisense oligonucleotide or some skipping therapies could potentially treat two-thirds of our community. Um, that the exons that you've listed, 51, 53, 45, and 44, I believe if you add in exon 50 there, you would be at about one-third of the community. So I wondered, is Dine making a commitment to look at those rare exons or trying to find a way to really expand that before portfolio to look at other exons that are likely more rare affecting fewer patients? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So thank you for asking that question. So as we as we've definitely said in the past, and um, as we we talk about internally often, we're committed to serving um, you know the the full spectrum of of mutations that are amenable to exon skipping. Um, so that is definitely something that we are we are very focused on. Um, I think that um, we we like other other uh, um, uh, manufacturers are trying to find uh, mechanisms to be able to accelerate uh, our foray into uh, additional exons. So from the Dyne perspective, um, you know, we have a, a technology that is modular in nature. Um, as I've described our technology in the past, uh, we use the same uh, antibody fragment and linker, and we can interchange different exon skipping uh, PMOs. And so that allows us to get through non-clinical development very efficiently and getting into the clinic uh, pretty efficiently. And then there just has to be more and more emphasis on uh, creative ways to be able to to address those rare exons where you you just don't have the patient numbers to be able to do the types of clinical trials that you can do with a 51 population or a 53 or 45 population. So we continue to work through uh, various means to develop those other exon skipping therapies and also how to make sure that we're developing them in a way uh, for for approval and access. And so, you know, that's what I can tell you at this point. And as we as we continue to progress the portfolio, um, I'll keep coming back and, and updating the community. And thank you, Ash. And I think we'll probably keep coming back and asking you about those rare exons. Uh, I okay. know that not only you have to look at the basic science and look at the re- you have to look at the regulatory path because you have so few patients that are going to be involved. But hopefully, with some of the um, Groups finding the N equal one or N equal few studies, there will be a, a way forward with that. Now, if we yeah, go it's to it's a great it's a great point. I mean, I think I think you're sorry to interrupt. I think it's a, it's a great point. Okay. You know, you can't do the um, type of placebo controlled studies when you get to those rare exons with so few patients, and so there has to be um, uh, there has to be real partnership with regulatory agencies on on what's required to get them you know to get them approved. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm hoping, you know, as I say, with those other initiatives that we all could gather and, and work with FDA and figure out what is the best path forward because, as you know, um, with Duchenne and many other rare diseases, when, when there's such an opportunity in more common hotspots as this or, or in areas where more patients are could be involved in the studies, it's hard to be sitting outside that bus waiting and hoping. So, um Hopefully, we can do things on the regulatory side and certainly on the industry side to, to bring these more rare exons um, into, into study. On slide number five, yeah. I, I think you, you've talked about your technology. I think this community is, is very familiar with the PMO or the morpholino chemistry and also the PPMO, the peptide conjugated chemistry. Can you... Just tell us about the differences here so that it's understandable about the linker and how this technology is, is different from uh, morpholino chemistry. Sure, happy to. So, um, so we are delivering a PMO. So we are delivering a phosphorylamidate morpholino ligamer uh, to um, to muscle cells to address the genetic basis of the disease. So, you know, that PMO exon skipping technology um, has been shown to be valid and be able to modify disease. Now, what we are doing is uh, taking this receptor-mediated approach, and I'll talk about the cell-penetrating peptide in a second, but we're taking uh, this receptor-mediated approach to deliver the PMO to the muscle cells. So we're using what we call this transferrin receptor 1, which is uh, found in abundance 
on skeletal muscle, including diaphragm, as well as cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. So we have a, uh, an antibody fragment that is linked to the exon skipping PMO and attaches to this receptor that's naturally found on muscle cells to drive the PMO in a targeted way into muscle cells. And so we're able to do this without any sort of membrane destabilizing agents or what have you to be able to have targeted delivery and hopefully limited uh, off-target effects. Now, the cell-penetrating peptide or the PPMO or other, other approaches that are attaching a, a PMO to a cell-penetrating peptide also use the, the morpholino oligomer, an exon skipping morpholino oligomer. Um, uh, the difference is that they're using this uh, peptide uh, attached to the PMO. And, um, you know, there's literature that suggests that, um, you know, they are able to drive their PMO into the cells through uh, a different mechanism uh, that that um, is um, perhaps a bit more nonspecific. And so um, what we believe is that we're able to have very, very um, uh, specific on-target delivery, which hopefully will allow us to have a pretty wide uh, therapeutic index. And I think we're seeing some of the results from some companies on the cell-penetrating peptide conjugated to the PMO and some of the data coming out in terms of dystrophin restoration as well as uh, safety and adverse events, which may indicate a slightly uh, or a much narrower therapeutic index, and, you know, time will tell. So, so we have this receptor-mated delivery system as opposed to a cell-penetrating peptide, which is, um, uh, you know, really um, through an en- sort of this process of endocytosis getting into various organs, which may um, may lead to some differences in terms of safety and tolerability. That said, um, you know, like all of us, hopefully all of these approaches um, uh, make it uh, over the regulatory um, finish line, uh, that there is access for patients and physicians. Um, you know, we all want the same thing, which is every single therapy and development to get onto the market and have more options for patients, whether it's exon skipping, whether it's gene therapy, you know, eventually gene editing. So the more we can have out there, the better. And we're all learning from one another. I think that's the important thing. It's great to have these different approaches. We're able to learn uh, different things from different approaches and then apply those learnings, whether it's in the the, the mechanism of action, uh, whether it's in the clinic and how, um, how different companies are approaching trials in the clinic. So it's been great to be able to learn from previous uh, experiences and apply those learnings to uh, to what we're doing in the clinic. Yeah, Ash, I totally agree that learning from each other. I think we're learning uh, learning from each other in this world of anesthesia and certainly in the gene therapy world. And I think that's all to the betterment of patients. And and you're exactly right to have many options or multiple options, um, just because we know that different patients respond differently to different approaches. So having options would be really amazing. You mentioned the, the receptor, the transferrin receptor, one that you're targeting. And you also mentioned that that receptor is also um, uh, present in, skeletal, in smooth muscle. I think that there are any number of young men who have some smooth muscle issues in terms of digestion and, el- and elimination. And I'm wondering if you, and again, this is probably off, off target in terms of a question, but theoretically this could um, if proven both safe and effective, improve skeletal muscle, both skeletal and smooth muscle as well. Is that right, or am I a little bit off yeah. on that? No, no, no. I think I think theoretically it's possible, and maybe even more than just theoretically. You know what we have shown uh, in our monkey studies, uh, for example, is the ability to get into uh, those um, uh, key uh, key you know GI muscles, if you will. Like the duodenum and, jejun- and the jejunum, so um, you know we are also um, uh, hopeful that there will be benefits uh, across the board. And, and smooth muscle, you know, it's, it's not talked uh, a lot about in in the Duchenne space, unlike other other uh, muscular dystrophies. And so um, you know, we we are you know we're we're hopeful that we're able to provide benefits there as well. And um, and again, from our monkey studies, we know we we get into smooth muscle robustly, and, and hopefully we'll be able to have some positive effects there. Yeah, it would be great. I, I know Rachel and Alexis um, are very aware 
in the CDCs that, that they, some of the GI docs are now seeing patients in, inside those uh, certified centers. And we are hearing um, many more uh, stories and many more uh, concerns around the GI and motility issues, digestion issues, and elimination issues. So, and as you know, as there's so little information and, and very little research, in fact, I haven't found any publications on research into smooth muscle. So this would be really a first for our community and it would be, I think, incredibly important, especially as we a young men get older and, and looking at your inclusion criteria, you're going to have some young, some adolescents and young adults in there. And I think that would be terrific and, and certainly a welcome uh, a welcome side effect, if you will, um, in terms of the targeting of this drug. So if we go to... I think it's great. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no. I was saying, yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. It's something that we definitely talk about um, within the company, for sure, and, um, and continue to continue to, to do research on. Great. And then uh, if we'll move to slide six. I will try. Okay. Yeah. Technology. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you've talked about this, and then more the 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 advanced dose. Um, you've talked about the trial. Um, what you know? What what we haven't talked about, uh, and in the next slide we'll see as well. When in your inclusion criteria of, of the four to sixteen year olds, you've said that this this uh, approach targets both cardiac, skeletal muscle, and now smooth muscle as well. Um, I'm wondering, first of all. Um, uh, you talked about a placebo. Are we talking a one-to-one placebo, a two-to-one placebo, or, or how are you thinking about this study? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. So, um, you know, we haven't disclosed uh, that level of detail uh, at this point, um, but uh, we will be disclosing uh, much more detail like that um, when we're closer to dosing, uh, you know, when we dose our first patient. Um one, one thing we've definitely um, discussed, I think, within the cab, uh, certainly, and, and, and other places, is the advantages and disadvantages of one-to-one placebo, two-to-one, three-to-one, et cetera. And so, you know, you know, what I will say is that um, we've been very thoughtful about the ratio of active to placebo from a number of angles. You know, one um, that we want to, you know, like all companies, you know, minimize. Um, how many how many participants are are on placebo to the extent that we we can do that in a way to not um, have a sample size that is too big um, to to make sure that we are able to to um, test the hypothesis that we want to test in this particular study. So um, we're definitely mindful of the importance of um, of one to one, two to one, three to one, et cetera, and we'll be disclosing more of that um, you know soon. Thank you. Um, so, so you're looking for 30 to 50 males between 16. I think that, first of all, we're delighted to have not good patients in this study um, and in all studies because, um, as you know, the exclusion criteria are uh, really heartbreaking for so many families who want to get into these studies. Uh, and, and the placebo and the duration of a placebo is always a risk and, and certainly a concern about patients um, joining a study. Right. Have you thought, is, is, are we to expect that given this is an, a multiple ascending dose study, that the study itself in terms of the protocol will be 12 months and then individuals who are randomized to placebo will be able to cross over after 12 months? Or are you thinking a longer duration? Uh, great, great question. Um, and again, I'm so sorry to, to say this. You know, we haven't um, publicly disclosed, um, you know, the duration of the placebo period. Again, we'll be doing that soon enough. Um, what I what I would say is that um, we wanted to we absolutely wanted to minimize uh, a couple of things. One is the point you made earlier is how many patients uh, will be on placebo um, while still being able to uh, appropriately test uh, the hypothesis we want to test here. Um, two, we want to minimize the duration of the uh, placebo period so that we can still have a study that has high integrity. Um, yet is um, less, you know, is, is least burdensome in that respect to families. And so we've been mindful of trying to um, minimize the, the duration of the placebo period to the extent possible. So I think, you know, based on, based on what you're, you're asking me here, I think we'll be, you know, we'll be on the, on the sort of, um, um, you know, better end 
uh, than, than, than a year. Um, but we, you know, again, we'll disclose that more specifically, uh, soon enough. And then one thing I, I, I'm, I think I mentioned, but I would reiterate is following the, uh, placebo period, all patients will then roll into the long-term extension or open label period. So, um, every patient will be, um, on active drug, um, following the placebo period. Great. And they will be continued as you move on to the phase three study, if that's where you're going, unless, uh, you know, obviously I, I know that's right. our fingers are that's right. Fingers are for an accelerated approval based on the study, but should you go into a phase three, they would be continued throughout the duration of your studies until a decision is made for uh, around the approval process. Is that right? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. So um, this is designed for, uh, for registration in the U.S via the accelerated approval pathway. So, you know, you're, you're absolutely correct. And I think I failed to mention that, so thank you. Um, and then, and then, yes, you know, we'll have a multi-year um, uh, study. You know, this study will be multi-year. So patients will be on drug. And, um, and there is, um, you know, a, you know, at Dine, that we will not be um, uh, putting uh, patients uh, in, in a position where, um, you know, they are left without, you know, without drugs. Uh, upon entering our trial. Good. That's good news. Uh, and as you talked about uh, the number of male participants here, what what uh, and you talked about a U.S. regulatory plan. Is is this going to be an international study, or are you intending it to be have international sites? Yeah. So yeah. this will be a this will be a global study for sure. Um, you know, we have been uh, doing the the kind of work that you would um, expect us to do. So we have been talking to um, very experienced trial sites inside the U.S. and outside of the U.S. to participate in this particular study. And then, of course, also in the hopes that these sites and more will participate in, um, in, in future uh, later stage studies. So this will be a global trial, um, uh, U.S. and ex-U.S. Um, uh, for sure. Um, we, we want to be able to make sure that we are serving patients to the extent we can, even through this trial, um, that are both, um, you know, ambulant and non-ambulant and, uh, and around the globe. Um, but we are developing a global program and we're, you know, we're really excited. And we've been doing a ton of work across the globe with Molly, myself, uh, and many others from, from the organization to be able to, um, educate on our platform, describe our data, and then provide insight into our clinical development plan. And then also getting feedback with all of those interactions, getting feedback and refining our thinking and refining our program. Thank you. And it was certainly a pleasure to see all of you at the Community Advisory Board meeting in Amsterdam. And another question that I've had, um, obviously a global, pro uh, global program means sites um, around the world, but it doesn't mean in every country around the world. So I wondered right. about your feelings about international patients coming uh, crossing borders in Europe or other places or international patients coming, for instance, in Central and South America coming into the U.S. And, and are you leaving this up to the PIs or, or are you, uh, or is there a policy around international patients that you're developing? Yeah. Um, great question. So, so the answer is we have already uh, contracted with an organization for this very reason. So we, we have contracted with a vendor that is going to um, allow uh, us the ability to um, have cross-border travel. It is one of the first things that we actually talked about when, when thinking about this study in addition to the, some of the uh, content here. Um, we want to be able to have the opportunity for patients to, you know, go from, you know, one country where, we, where, they, where there may not be a neuromuscular center of excellence to a country um, where we're running the trial. So we will absolutely um, have the ability uh, to make that happen uh, in terms of cross-border travel uh, and support. Um, so, um, you know, in terms of specific countries and details, um, you know, I, I think there is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're ready to have those conversations with the PIs and, and families. Um, uh, and so um, we feel really good about, about the, the program that we have already set up um, and um, as, as, you, as you may recall, at the CAB meeting, 
we described um, uh, some of that service as well. It was still in, in build mode at the time, but we've now, you know, sort of fully completed that that work. So we're excited to be able to support cross-border travel. But I'm really thrilled about that, Ash. And if I'm a parent coming from another country into whatever, um, what I, I know you can't describe the protocol, but, but maybe this is a teacher question, and if you can't answer it, you, please feel free to say, um, am I to expect that this uh, we are freak, we are very aware of the approved drugs right now that are in, in the world of innocence, uh, 51, 53, 45, that are available to patients right now. So a couple questions around that. If I'm coming from another country, do you anticipate or, or can you say out loud whether this is a, a weekly infusion and if it's IV or subcutaneous? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the goal for us um, is to have a trial, uh, first of all, that is at most frequent monthly dosing. So mo- most frequent will be monthly, and um, and we are going to uh, look for opportunity for even less frequent dosing based on our non-clinical data. Uh, you know, we believe there are certainly uh, there's certainly an opportunity for um, even less frequent than once a month. And, um, yeah, I did not mention uh, root of administration. It is going to be uh, IV uh, in terms of root, of root of administration. Great. Thank you. And um, um, even on a monthly, you know, if it's every month that this infusion takes place, should you have a young man um, or a young patient who really has struggles with the IV infusion, are ports acceptable as well? Over. Yep. So, what we've done, um, as, as um, I think one would expect us to do, is we've done studies um, uh, looking at, um, you know, this, uh, you know, this uh, 9251 compound um, uh, administered through a port in terms of the typical uh, studies you'd want to do to make sure that uh, it's stable and, 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 and appropriate. So um, we will uh, absolutely be able to uh, enroll uh, participants who have ports. Okay, oh, thank you. Um, and then about a washout period, if you're on on a drug that has been approved um, and you feel that this this might be something you're interested in, um, can what is the washout period? And have you are you allowed to talk about that as well? Is it a three month, six month? Just so if you're starting relatively yep. soon in the next six months, so parents who are interested and people with the diagnosis who are interested can think through. You know, well, how long do I have to wash out in order to screen for the study? Sure. Um, yeah. So we haven't um, we haven't talked about that, uh, you know, uh, broadly, um, but it's it's absolutely a, a critical question. So um, uh, we we uh, will be allowing uh, participants on prior exon skipping therapies, and um, you know, we'll disclose more details around uh, the the washout period. Um, but but one would imagine it wouldn't be that different from what um, uh, you know PPMO has has you know um, uh, articulated or or previously um, the through the Durson program. So you know in that time frame of you know 12 weeks or so is 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 um, is is kind of where we're at. So um, we 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 know that um, we we want to build in that option for families who are on uh, exon skipping therapies currently be able to, to wash out appropriately. Um, and we'll give more details on, on exactly what that means um, in, the, in the coming weeks. But, and, and then my follow-on question is, what about patients who are amenable to a 51 skip and have been in a gene therapy protocol? Yeah, so um, that, that um, again, we haven't disclosed that, but um, I don't think it would surprise um, anyone that um, for our first in human study, uh, where we're really trying to um, understand the, the the full treatment effect of dying two five one, it would be difficult to allow patients who are on prior who have received prior uh, gene therapy. Um, but again, we'll be disclosing uh, you know details around that in the coming weeks. Right. Um, we do have a question about children in India or young men in India. Um, I, I, you know, I know that you can't identify your sites at this moment, but I certainly want you to keep in mind that there are any number of 
of young boys and some girls in India that really could benefit by an Exxon 51 skip. So just to keep it on your radar without, and as I say, I know you can't disclose sites at this moment. I have a couple other questions for you. Um, and one is a sibling protocol, Ash. You know, it is, as you might imagine, you have a boy who's 20 years old and you have a boy who's eight and the uh, eight-year-old fits into the criteria do you have a policy or thoughts about how to include or how to figure out um, how you might treat the siblings in, in terms of the protocol? Yeah. So we've actually talked about that. I think your 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 voice has been in Molly's ear, in my ear, uh, and and others of dying. Uh, not just your voice, but certainly we've heard this from the from the community. Um, so we are thinking through uh, this. Um, this aspect of, of a sibling protocol, how to um, how to um, you know how to address siblings that you know for whatever reason you know won't be in the study, um, but we 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 think that there is a, a reason uh, or a good reason that um, this this particular potential therapeutic could be uh, useful. So I don't have specifics uh, to share with you at this moment. Um, but please know that um, we are working through that that very question, and um, and I, I know you'll ask me again at another time. And um, I'm committed to coming back to you with, with more specifics. Good, good, good. Thank you. Um, and my last question, and I'll turn it back over to Eric. Is um, it, it's really about compassionate use? I think that um, people who are outside the country and can't get to a clinical site, or people who um, really aren't eligible for for the inclusion criteria for to 16 years, but yet amenable to 51. Um, how does Dyn feel about compassion? And is there ever or, or an individual IND, depending on the country and its regulatory status or regulatory um, approaches, w- would Dyn consider um, consider an individual IND under certain circumstances? Yeah. So um, so we've we've uh, also, uh, talked about this internally and, and, and maybe I'll just take a kind of a, for, first a bit of a step back. So, um, uh, maybe under the broader term of, of, um, an expanded access program. And I, and I know what you're saying in terms of compassionate use or, or, um, uh, individualized IND, but we have thought through very carefully over, um, several months about how we would want to approach, um, you know, sort of an expanded access program, if you will. Um, and so, you know, we are developing uh, that policy and that will be, um, you know, rolled out, um, uh, you know, in the coming months uh, more publicly. Um, I, I think the the current way I would address it is we, we need to get some clinical data, get some experience, understand safety tolerability, et cetera, um, and then we can make decisions on um, both what uh, compassionate use may look like or expanded access program may look like or or otherwise, and then also the timing for such programs. And so, um, like any other company, we would love to be able to 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 make this um, you know broadly available in different with different mechanisms that are available to sponsors, um, you know even before registration. Um, however, there's a lot of steps for us to go through. Um, there is data we want to accumulate uh, in the clinic to best understand you know, to best understand the product. Um, nobody would want us to open up these kinds of programs without, um, you know, uh, clinical data that gives us a good view into um, into the effects of Dyn 251. So um, this is something that we'll definitely continue to talk about, both uh, internally uh, and certainly externally. Um, but please be assured that we, um, we're spending a lot of time in thinking through these questions. Um, right now, we just we need to start generating data. Great. I don't disagree. And and one last thing that I I would be remiss if I didn't ask. You have a cardiac target. What are your cardiac endpoints? How are you going to measure the heart? Um, because as you know, we are all concerned with the heart and have a great deal of emphasis on the question, the heart is a muscle too, and is it built to last if you're able to express the stroke and, and really push out those timelines of keeping ambulation into the 20s and 30s, hopefully. Um, what kind of cardiac outcome measures are you thinking about here? Sure, sure. Thank you. And and yeah, I think I didn't actually cover this. So um, as you as you pointed out, um, we are particularly excited 
about the expression, uh, the, the exon skipping, the dystrophin expression, uh, and certainly the dystrophin positive fibers, um, that we are, we're, we're able to demonstrate in our animal studies in, in the diaphragm, but also in the, in the cardiac muscle. Um, you know, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing data. So, um, we will be looking at cardiac function in our study as well. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not able to, at this time, I'm not going to be able to go through the specific endpoints, but, you know, we will be doing echoes and cardiac MRI. Great. I, I can't thank you enough, Ash and Molly, and your whole team has been really very present to our community, and we certainly wish you Godspeed, and with, and we're anxious to see that first uh, trial posted on clinicaltrials.gov and, and be able to help you through our registry recruit those patients that are going to be so anxious and excited to participate in your study, and I can't thank you enough for all that you do. I'm going to turn this back to Eric. Thank you. Eric, it's up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Um, I'd also like to take a moment just to remind everyone on the line that if uh, you are interested in learning uh, more about uh, Dyn251, um, Ash did give a, a really nice talk at PPMD's annual conference last month um, looking at their preclinical data. Um, that is still up on the conference hub website, and we will be sure to as well pull that out and um, have that on our YouTube page and under the, the product description on our um, clinical trial pipeline. So uh, more information there if you want to take a little bit of a, a deeper dive. Um, we will, of course, uh, upload uh, this recording as well um, in, the, in the next day or so, so please share with any of your um, family members or friends uh, who uh, you think this would be of value to. Um, and as Pat mentioned, uh, once we hear about the first uh, patient being dosed, we will be sure to update the community um, about that, as well as the uh, updated information that Diane is going to share about the trial at that time. Um, so, Ash, uh, Molly, uh, thank you both uh, for joining us today and uh, answering all of our questions. Uh, we, we really appreciate it, and we you know, wish you the best of luck once the trial gets underway. Sounds great. Thank you Thanks, so much, Eric. Thank you, Pat.